Gary Kerr for uh, holding down the fort while we were away. And I know he did a great job. And um, so for those that were online, I know that they had some technical difficulties and couldn't get the sound to work or something. They got the camera working, but couldn't get the sound working. You were my <laughs> your mommy. Charades, right? So, but uh, anyways, I think my wife was able to film it with her phone. So if you need to go on there, to, you can see it there. So um, it was handmade done. So anyways, but we had a good time. Uh, the conference was fantastic. Um, it was very uh, enlightening. It was very changing, transforming, um, empowering. Um, it's exactly what I needed. And so I am fired up and ready to... Uh, probably what I'm going to do is I know we need to finish the book of, 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 uh, um, <laughs> Joshua. I kept saying Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah. We got to finish the book of Joshua, but uh, I'm probably going to put that on hold because I got a lot of sermons that I want to preach that are burning in my heart. That I, so I know, <laughs> right. And so, um, so, yeah, so I've got a lot of sermons that I've been wanting to preach on for a while, and uh, I just don't want to wait any longer. So we'll probably um, uh, put that on hold for just a little bit because I, I just want to I think the messages will be timely and for our day today. So anyways. All right. So <clears throat> let's uh, have a word of prayer and we'll get right to it this, this evening. Let's pray. Father God, again, thank you for tonight. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us back home safely. Um, thank you, Lord, for this church, for their prayers, uh, for all of us in the conference. Thank you, God, for those men like Gary that can uh, preach and fill in the pulpit. And I just pray, God, that you would bless us now tonight and, and that, uh, Father, you would use me. Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you would fill me and use me tonight as I preach, Lord, to preach to your people. Um, God, I need you um, so much, and I just... I just thank you for what you're going to do and what you're going to say. And Lord, just thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this time of Bible study. Change us tonight, Lord. Transform us tonight. I pray all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Romans chapter number 8. We'll begin reading in verse number 17 and we'll go through verse number 25. And then we'll get right into the message. Verse 17. Well, let me go back up to verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance." Now, we've covered all the way from this chapter, verse 1 through verse 17, all the way through the half of verse 17. And I told you um, the last time we met that I was going to talk about suffering. As a matter of fact, in your notes, you'll see I entitled it, How to Endure Suffering. Because Paul says something here in verse 17 and verse 18 and in concluding that has to deal with suffering. Of course, we know in verse 17, he says, if indeed we suffer with him, him being Christ, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, before I get into the text, because I'm going to break this down and we're going to go with this, and I'm going to uh, bring these verses together and, and give you a, a mini sermon right in those. But before we do that, I want to talk to you a little bit about Christian suffering, okay? I want to talk to you a little bit about Christian suffering. There are three ways, and I don't have these in your notes, but 
There are three ways in which we all experience suffering. And those three ways are, number one, we all experience suffering from the fall. We all experience suffering from the fall, being the fall of Adam and Eve. Because of the fall, matter of fact, turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Turn all the way back to the first book. We'll look at two, two passages of Scripture real quick. Genesis 3. Because of the fall of Adam and Eve, all kinds of things came into the world. Sickness, disease, decay, and death came into the world. As a matter of fact, in Genesis chapter number 3, verse number 14, we find that after Adam and Eve were found out, Eve said, the serpent deceived me and I ate in verse 13 and verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now here comes the judgment to the woman and man, Adam and Eve. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception in pain you shall bring forth children. So before the fall, birth was something that was painless. So pain entered the scene. And God said, in pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Verse 17, Adam said, and to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field in the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Now we understand that when Adam and Eve fell, when they committed that sin, all of these things, things happened in the world. They brought in, or all of this combined came in, death, sickness, disease, decay. And we also know that death came in because God told them, he says, the day that you eat of it, you will die, right? And so we find also in the book of Romans chapter number five, we find that death has now passed upon all men for all have sinned. Matter of fact, verse 12 of Romans 5, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Now, this is why because of the fall of Adam and Eve, this is why we suffer from the fall. We suffer things like arthritis, cancer, fibromyalgia, colds, flu, cataracts, blood diseases, Alzheimer's, tendinitis, and you name it. All because of the fall. None of this was around when Adam and Eve, before they sinned. They were perfect. Everything was perfect. They were healthy. Everything was great until they disobeyed God. So, Here's the key, is that we all experience suffering from the fall. Now, understand that there are some people, I want to say a lot of people, but there are some people who are deceived into thinking that once you come to Christ, um, that you no longer are subject to this type of suffering, that all of a sudden, the suffering from the fall goes away. You won't contract a disease. You won't get sick. You won't get cancer. You won't deal with arthritis. You won't deal with cataracts um, or Cadillacs. You won't deal with tendinitis. Um, you won't deal with any of that. But you need to understand that that is false. That is false. You will always suffer from the fall of Adam and Eve. We will experience physical suffering from the fall of Adam and Eve. Here's another way we suffer, and that is we all experience suffering from God. Paul tells us in our text that we are children of God. Text back in Romans chapter number eight, he says, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. Verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. But he tells us in verse 15 that because we are sons of God is because we've been adopted. We are adopted children of God. And because we are adopted, here's the thing. Because we became adopted, 
We cannot live like we used to live when we were unadopted. It's kind of like my wife and I um, do foster care and we have adopted. And, and some of you know what adoption and foster care is like. But when you adopt a child, when you bring a child in your home, they're used to a certain way of living. They're used to running wild. They're used to having no rules. They're used to having no structure. They're used to having not being told what to do or what they can't do. But once they come into your home, they are now, they're under structure. They're under uh, uh, authority. They're under things that they, uh, 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 rules of things they can do and cannot do. Now, what do you think is the majority of the kids, once they are coming from one situation of how they used to live, uh, Judy Shaker says, yep, and coming now into this where there's structure and everything, what do you think it's like for that child? It's horrible, right? And do you think they just fit right in? They're like, yeah, we're going to, yeah, it'll be right. Kind of like Christians, right? We're... But here's the thing. So, so what happens is, is that they get into this new environment and now they can't act like they used to act. They can't do things like they used to do. Why? Because now you've adopted them into your family and they are now a reflection of you. Some of you nod your head. Some of you are going, uh-uh. <laughs> we are a reflection of Christ. Because we are adopted, we can no longer live like we used to. We must repent and forsake our sin in our lives. And we don't want God to bring about... Let me rephrase that. When we don't want God to bring about suffering in our lives, to bring about repentance and transformation. So when we don't... The reason why we change and the reason why God wants us to become more like Christ is because we are a reflection of him. And so therefore, he calls us to repentance. He calls us to forsake our sin in our lives so that we will become the children that reflect who he is. Psalm 119.67 says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. See, God, because we are his children, we will suffer from God as his children so that he may change us and transform us into the image of Christ. Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12 says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. And of course, you know the one in Hebrews. You can turn there. Hebrews chapter number 12. Look there real quick in verse number, um, verse number seven, Hebrews chapter 12, verse seven. Notice what the writer says. He says, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons for what son is there whom a father does not chasten. But if you are without chastening of which all have become partakers, then you are illeg illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. Amen. Being chastened, disciplined, is not a pleasant thing. Going through suffering is not a pleasant thing. But, he says, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have, what? Been trained by it. We not only experience uh, suffering from the fall, but we experience suffering from God. And God's intent in our suffering is to bring us back. His intent on suffering is to transform our lives, to get our eyes back on him, to produce righteousness in us. And then thirdly, what we're going to talk about tonight is we all experience suffering from the world. We all experience suffering from the world. The suffering that we receive from the world is called persecution. And as we live obedient lives for God, we will suffer persecution. Now, there are a few things about this type of suffering 
that I want to make you aware of. And the first thing is this. We must expect suffering. We must expect suffering for being a Christian. You must expect suffering for being a child of God. Jesus told us over and over, matter of fact, in Matthew chapter number 10, turn there with me. You've got the scripture there in your notes, so you know where we're going to be going with this. But in Matthew chapter 10, notice what Jesus says. In Matthew 10, verse 16, Jesus says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Now brother will deliver up brother to death and a father his child. And children will, will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For as surely I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 9, you have this in your notes. Jesus said, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Luke 21, verses 16 and 17, Jesus said, you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends. And they will put some of you to death and you will be hated for all my name's sake. Jesus told us that we can expect suffering in this area of persecution, in the area of living as a Christian, living for Christ, being born again, being a child of God, that we can expect suffering. Jesus told us this. The apostles foretold this as well. Look at Acts chapter 14 and verse number 21. Acts 14. Notice what he says here. <clears throat> Acts 14, verse, 20, verse 21, he says, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, saying, We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. 1 Corinthians 4, listen to what Paul says. <clears throat> this is good. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9. Paul says, For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last, as men condemned to death, for we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. Take that in for just a second, what Paul just said. To the present hour, Paul says, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. You think we got it bad? And we labor working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure, being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscoring of things until now. When was the last time you were known for that? Think about that. This was Paul's words to this church. This is who we are. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, he says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 
Philippians 1.29, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. 1 John 3.13 says, Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. As Jesus' representatives on earth, we will suffer for His name's sake. And I think that the time is coming that we are going to suffer like we have never experienced before. I think we are coming to a time in our day where Christians are going to be pointed out. I really think the church, Big C Church, is going to be sifted. I really think that um, true Christians are going to be recognized, but not in a good way. Acts 9, verses 15 and 16 Paul the Apostle, Saul at this time, got saved. His name changed to Paul. He's blind. And as he's being led, the Lord speaks to, um, was it Ananias? I think it was. And the Lord says to him, and I'm going to paraphrase, Hey, you remember that guy named Saul of Tarsus? Well, guess what? He just got saved. And uh, he's going to be an instrument of mine, and I want you to go grab him, and I want you to talk to him and disciple him. And he goes, now, wait a minute, Lord, that's that guy that killed Christians. And that's that guy that persecuted people. Matter of fact, I remember he was there when Stephen was stoned. And in verse 15, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. We're like, yes, wouldn't you want to do that? Wouldn't you want to be the one that God chooses to bear his name to everyone in Topeka, right? He goes, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the church. Yes, Lord, that's what I want. But then he goes on to say, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now it gets hard, doesn't it? Now it gets hard. But how do we respond to this suffering? Because we've got to expect that it's going to come. Now, and let's just be honest. When was the last time any of us really suffered persecution? I mean, really? It was, you don't have to answer. You don't, don't answer out loud. But really, when was the last time any of us truly suffered like Paul talks about? When was the last time you were known as the filth of the world? When was the last time that you were known as... The, 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 the outcast of society because of what you believe, because of your faith in Christ, because of your gospel sharing. When was the last time we were truly persecuted? And I speak to myself as well, because I must say I haven't been persecuted either. Matter of fact, I don't know of any Christians that are truly persecuted here in America. I never hear stories of Christians being persecuted here in America. You hear it in other countries, but not here in America. And I'm going to answer about that here in just a moment. But how do, we, how, do we, how do we respond to that suffering when it does come? Well, first of all, I want you to understand, going back to our text in Romans chapter number eight is, is this. Number one, our suffering, remember, our suffering identifies us with Christ. Paul said in verse 17, he said, And children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You see, suffering affirms that we are children of God. Suffering affirms that we are his kids. John 15, this is really good. John 15 and verse number 18. Listen to what Jesus says. John 15 Verse number 18, Jesus said this, if the world hates you, are you hated? <laughs> if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If, listen, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, Therefore, the world hates you. Now, does the world hate us as Christians because Jesus called us to salvation? Does the world hate us because Jesus said, they hate you because I called you? Does, does the world hate us because 
we say and profess we are born again? Does the world hate us because we know and by faith that we are and have received Christ and we are going to be in heaven one day in glory? Does, is that why the world hates us? Why does the world hate us? They hated Jesus. But why did they hate Jesus? Because they what? They loved their darkness. He exposed their sin. You hear it all this? What does John tell us? That they, what? Light came into the world, but they rather stay in darkness. They loved their darkness. You see, the world hates us not because we call ourselves Christians. Listen, a lot of people call themselves Christians, right? A lot of people call themselves Christians. The world doesn't hate us because we call ourselves Christians. The world hates us because we behave differently. And we speak differently. It's because we proclaim the name that is offensive. You know, isn't it funny? This isn't in my notes, but I'm going to go ahead and stay on this for just a second. Isn't it funny how we can talk about everything under the sun? You've heard me say this before, and it's the truth. We can talk about everything under the sun. We can even talk about politics. And we can go back and forth about politics. And we go back for a Republican, Democrat, whatever, Biden, Trump, all this other stuff. But you start mentioning the name Jesus, people clam up. People turn away. Conversation over. We even struggle as Christians to get it out. <laughs> Some of y'all nodding your head. Some of y'all like, what? Right, less of using, right, but I'm saying as a, as a gospel presentation, sharing people who Jesus is, this is what Jesus did for me. This is how, why I love Jesus. This is why I follow Jesus. This is why I love Jesus. We, we can't say that we struggle even getting that out. Why? Because the world hates it. You can talk about God all you want, just don't mention Jesus. Right? So, uh, I know I've said too much. So anyways, um, uh, remember verse 20. He says, remember, uh, excuse me, verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. John 17 and verse 14. Jesus said, I have given them your word as he prays to the father. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Jesus even said, you will be hated. Because of our, our suffering identifies us with Christ. Here's the thing. This is what I ought to do for us. Because our suffering identifies us with Christ. Here's the thing. We should glory in that. We should be excited about that. It ought not to be something that we frown from or it, not, it ought to be something that we cower to. But it ought to be something that we rejoice saying, yes, yes, I am a child of God. I am suffering for Jesus Christ or I am suffering for his name. Look at with me in first Peter chapter number four. This is good stuff. First Peter chapter number four. And notice with me in uh, verse number 12. 1 Peter chapter number 4, verse number 12. Now I know when I said that none of us are persecuted, that, that's really not a true statement because I know that all of you at one time or another had been has been persecuted for the name of Christ. Um, I know working at Coca-Cola, you know, I got it. You know, uh, I remember when I first got saved in Florida working for Coca-Cola, you know, I got the name calling Bible Thumper, you know. Holier than thou, right? Here comes Tim. Everybody watch your mouth. Sarcastically, right? Put away the magazines, fellas. <coughs> you know all this stuff. And then the persecution also came to where they knew that I was a Christian. 
that I no longer wanted to drink. I no longer wanted to look at dirty magazines, all that stuff. But yet they would still, hey, Tim, look. Hey, Tim, come on. Come on, you can have one. You know, it was all that persecution that constantly came because I was living for Jesus. My behavior changed. And so, therefore, persecution came. And I know it comes to you guys, too. I know at the job, you, you know, on the workforce, you probably don't have a whole lot of friends because, you know, you mentioned Jesus or you live for Jesus. They know you're a Christian. They know you go to church. They know you're committed to the Lord. And, you know, and, and they probably don't want anything to do with you. They're afraid you might rub something off on them, you know. I just think it's conviction. I think that the more, the closer you are to God, the more that conviction, a person is convicted being in your presence because you have the Holy Spirit within you. I believe people, I remember that Billy Sunday was once told, Ben, you know who Billy Sunday is? Gary, I know you know Billy Sunday. Stone, you know. It was once said of Billy Sunday that he was so close to God that people repent of their sins when they came within three feet of him that they would repent and come to Christ. He was so close to God. And I'm like, I want that, you know? And so let me go on. Uh, uh, Cause we'll never get done. Oh, look at that. See, I'm already supposed to be done. Let's, let me finish this. Um, verse 12, let, let's move real fast. He says, beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, the trial, this suffering, this persecution, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Peter says, listen, you ought to be excited. You ought to uh, 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 rejoice in this. Why? Because you're partaking of Christ's sufferings. He says in verse 14, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. Hey, Tim, you're one of those sorry, no good for Christians. Yay, amen. You know, you know. Courtney, you're one of those, you know, Bible thumpers. Amen. Yes, I am. You know, so he says, rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Isn't that, rejo- isn't that exciting to know that you're being persecuted because God is resting upon you. God is being shown through you. It's like, it's like you're shining for the Lord. Everybody hates you, but you've got a smile on your face and you go, this is great. You know, this is, what are you smiling for, Tim? Go, this is great. <laughs> I haven't done anything wrong and you're mad, <laughs> right? <laughs> so he says on their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he's glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evil doer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Now, this is good. He says, you're going to suffer, but be careful. Don't say you're suffering for Christ and you're suffering as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. He says, yet if anyone suffers as as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. May we glorify God because of suffering identifies us with Christ. Man, it ought to make us glory in that. And not only are we identified with Christ, but our suffering, uh, by our suffering, we should glory in it all the time. I love, uh, uh, and I won't turn, you can look at that, uh, uh, Matthew 5, I've used that not too long ago, Matthew 5, 12. Jesus said, blessed are you when men persecute you. But Acts chapter 5, this is good, I got to do Acts 5 because this is really good. Um, Acts chapter 5, verse number 40 um, after Peter and the apostles were, were, uh, <laughs> this is funny after they were beaten and, and, and they were told, listen, don't preach in Jesus anymore. Um, you can't do this anymore. And, and you got to stop what you're doing. Acts chapter five. And it says, and, and, and they agreed with him. Uh, and when they had called for the apostles and, and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So here's all the apostles that they got their beatings. So they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing. Could you imagine? I mean, if it was for real, like I know it's for real, but I mean, I don't know how they acted rejoicing, but could you imagine if they got their beatings and they're bloody and they're bruised and they let them go and they're all skipping? Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And they're all people freaking out going, what? 
They departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Now, I'm sure it probably wasn't they were skipping down the street, but I'm sure in heart that they were rejoicing. Now, that says something that after you've been beaten and suffered bodily, that you can honestly rejoice in your heart that you just suffered for the name of Christ, that you just suffered for, for being a Christian. That is amazing. Paul said in Colossians 1.24, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the affections of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. And let me close. I, I just got to get this done because this is really good. We should rejoice because, here's the other part, not just because it identifies us with Christ, but back to our text. We should rejoice because our suffering can't compare with what awaits us. In verse 18, Paul says, back to our text, he says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time, of this present time, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Look what Paul said. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, going through this persecution, being suffering, or suffering at this time, it's not to be compared with what the, will happen in the future. Our sufferings can't compare with the heavenly bliss that awaits us. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 and verse 17, Paul says this. I love this. <clears throat> Paul says, for our light affliction. I love that. He says that light affliction. Now, you know, Paul wasn't lightly afflicted at all, right? Like he was heavily afflicted, right? But he says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Here's the thing. Suffering isn't forever. Persecution isn't forever, right, guys? I mean, we're not in jail, right? Come on. We're not in shackles, right? We're not being beaten. So we get called a couple of names, right? So we lose some friends. So we get people that don't want to hang out with us anymore because we're Christians, because we choose to behave and live for Christ. Right? But it's just for a short, but it's really nothing. It's light affliction. Suffering isn't forever. Now, here's the thing. One of the dangers, one of the dangers of a Christian when it comes to suffering is that we can compromise our Christianity so as not to incur suffering or incur suffering, excuse me. You see, when we live in the flesh instead of the spirit, we compromise our Christianity and we will never incur suffering. And maybe this is why most Christians are not experiencing suffering because we have compromised so much that we have now become an acceptable Christianity to the world. The world doesn't hate us anymore. They used to, but they don't now. And they don't hate us anymore because we are just like them. That means we what? Oh, salt. I thought you said we lost ourselves, And I was like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> right. We lost our saltiness, right? Now it's good for nothing, Jesus said, but be thrown on the ground to be trampled. Right? Men don't light a candle and put it under a bushel. They put it on a candlestick and they put it up on high so everyone can see. Jesus said, remember in John 17 or John 15, when Jesus said, the world hates you because it hated me first. You are not of the world. That's why it hates you. So the opposite of that would be the world won't hate you because you're like them. You see, America loves Christianity that's acceptable to them. That's why, Chris, you said you can talk about God. That's okay. They, because they form their own God. But when you get explicit or specific, explicit, specific, that Jesus, right, that's when it gets tough. And so I'll close with this last point. Because our suffering can't compare to what awaits us in verse 19, let's go back to our text in Romans 8. Our suffering can be endured because we know what lies ahead. Paul says, for I consider in verse 18 that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. 
For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Why? For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of God who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Even creation itself is groaning and can't wait to be made new. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, it corrupted everything. Verse 23, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption. What? The redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope. What hope? The hope of the redemption of our body. The suffering's not going to last long. This corruption will put on incorruption. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Because we have this hope within us, we can endure suffering. Think about the redemption of our bodies. Last passage I'll have you turn to, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Last passage, 1 Corinthians 15. You've got one more at the bottom. You can look at that on your own when you get home. 1 Corinthians 15. Listen to what Paul says. This is good. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 50. Paul says... Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. You see, we understand that we have this hope going back to our text in verse 23, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the redemption of our bodies. That's our hope. The word hope there in our text is to look forward with confidence. We know that one day this corruption will put on incorruption. We know that one day this mortal will put on immortality. We know that one day we will be changed. The word eagerly in the text means to, to wait eagerly or expectantly for some future event. Do you understand what that says? expectantly. I'm expecting one day Jesus is going to come and I am going to be changed. Therefore, the persecution that people want to say to me, Bible thumper, all Christian boy or whatever, they want to uh, uh, leave me and, and, and forsake me, all my friends and my worldly friends, or, or they want to do this or do this and call me names, or they want to, here we go, if they want to run me down the road on Facebook... They want to blow up my name on Facebook. One of the places we're so concerned about how we're being looked at on Facebook or Instagram or whatever social media we have. We're consumed with, well, we don't want anybody to think we're too conservative or this or too religious that or too close to Christ this. So what if they're going to do that? Who cares? Because one day Jesus is going to come and I'm going to be changed. I could care less. People want to persecute me and we should all be that same way, eagerly waiting, anticipating. And the word perseverance in the text and the Greek means capacity. Listen, capacity to continue to bear up under difficult circumstances. 
Do you know why we can bear persecution? Do you know why it shouldn't bother us? Well, I know it kind of bothers us to some extent, but we should still rejoice. Do you know why, 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 why we can be persecuted and it really not affect us or bother us that way? Because why? Verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. We have this hope within us. We are eagerly anticipating what's going to happen to us when Jesus comes and therefore we can persevere, that word perseverance, we can endure what we're going through because we know who we are, we know whose we are, and we know that one day we are going to be changed. And that's why we can go through suffering. That's why we can go through the suffering that Paul talks about. That if we are a Christian indeed, if indeed we suffer with him. You see, Christian, listen, you can expect it if you're a child of God, if you are saved, you will suffer persecution. Say, pastor, I've been a Christian for a long time, but I've never suffered persecution. Well, listen, are you living for Jesus? That's all you got to do. Are you living for Jesus? Are you? Now, I'm not saying, Pastor, I don't smoke, I don't drink, and I don't chew, and I don't go out with girls who do. I don't do any of that. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. Do you mention the name of Jesus at all? Do, do you mention Jesus at all to anybody? Because once you do, just be ready, because then it's going to come. You say, but pastor, I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't want to do that. Jesus made a statement. <laughs> and this is what scares me. Jesus made the statement and said this. If you deny me before men. You say, but pastor, I didn't outright like, deny any, but I didn't deny Jesus. To anybody. I had nobody say you deny Jesus. I've never done that. Listen, if you refuse to talk about Jesus, isn't that the same as denying him? If you refuse to spread the gospel as Jesus has told us to do, if you refuse to talk about Jesus in any way, is that not the same as denying him that you're scared to mention his name because you're scared to suffer persecution for his name? You're scared to be counted as one of his? May we never be afraid of that. May we never be scared of that. May we be bold in our faith and may we be strong as a Christian. May we understand what Paul just said, that we have this hope, this, this eager waiting, this anticipation that Christ is coming. His rewards are with him, <laughs> right? And one day, and, and we're going to be changed. We're going to be like he is and we're going to know all things and He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's the thing that keeps us going. That's that promise. That's that hope. This is my friend. Don't be afraid to be counted with Christ. Because you may find yourself not counted with Christ. And many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord. Did we not do this in your name? And did we not do that? And he said, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So, I've got to close. It's quarter off. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. Father, I know it's easy for me to speak about enduring suffering up here in the pulpit. I know as a preacher that you called me to proclaim your word and to teach this truth, in which I am a firm believer of. But Father, I know it's easy for me to even be saying that, and here I am, 